Great. Welcome to our first uh, of two panel discussions. Uh, we have three uh, uh, very illustrious panelists. Uh, Felipe, who is a professor at the uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education. Fernando as well, who's a professor at Huxley as well. And Abhijit, uh, who uh, runs uh, MIT uh, JPL and, and has done a lot of work across uh, Asia and the emerging world. Um, I'm going to pass it on and ask each of our panelists. The topic here is what has worked, and so we're looking at evidence from uh, around the world. Uh, we're going to get started with uh, Felipe, and then I'll ask Abhijit to make some comments, and Fernando. Um, eight to ten minute intro, and then we'll, uh, we'll jump into Q&A thereafter. Thank you very much. I am going to be very fast. Uh, I have to say something that is uh, going to be very obvious. I am an economist. And I am going to talk uh, similar topics as, as uh, Kartik uh, just did. As fast as, as, fast <laughs> as, as him. So uh, th during the last two decades, there has been an explosion of evidence and, and uh, coming from developing countries. Education is at the frontier of this, of this, of this revolution. And uh, one thing that is very hard is to make sense of all this evidence. Uh, because it's very scattered in different components of the system. So what I'm going to do is I am going to show you my generic school, and I'm going to talk about that school, and I am going to talk about different components of that school. So the first component that I want to talk about is students, and I want to know something about the opportunity and the right cost of going to education, information, and incentives. What, uh, there are different margins to, to consider in the, in, the, in the margin of students and their families. Uh, one is that the direct cost of attending schools are maybe important. This includes user fee, uniform, scholarships, and direct cost of attending schools can be important. This includes opportunity cost and community time. Information about the returns of education may be important because uh, families take the decision of sending the kid uh, to school based on the benefit and the cost and if they don't know the returns of education, that may prevent them to send them. And uh, the last point that I want to make is about teaching uh, students' incentives in which you give rewards to kids uh, to go to school. What, what, what is my reading of the evidence? My reading of the evidence is direct cost uh, and indirect cost are very important uh, to uh, determine enrollment. So that's one first, uh, one, uh, first piece of evidence is that if you reduce the co opportunity cost or the indirect cost or you uh, give incentives uh, to kids to, to go to school, they are going to arrive. Uh, information about the returns of education can trigger enrollment, uh, uh, the, uh, higher enrollment. Incentives to students uh, is tricky because uh, it may be the case that uh, students don't know how to transfer effort to, let's say, if we are measuring learning by test scores, it's very difficult uh, for them to know how to transfer effort to test scores. So in this part, we know exactly, or we are very, uh, we, we know a lot of things about how to, how to, 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 to make kids arrive to school. The problem, of course, is that once they arrive to school, uh, if they learn or not. And everything points out that it's very mixed. Kids that are arriving to school may or not uh, learn. So the next component that I want to talk is about the organization of the school. I'm going to be very narrow. I want to talk about the class size. I want to talk about time of school. And I want to uh, talk about curriculum. What do we know about class size? If any, my reading of the evidence again is that class size doesn't matter by itself. You need to do other things to make a uh, worth. The other point is that t time in a school, if something, the evidence is very weak. It doesn't matter if you increase the, the number of hours in the school, because more of the same is not going to translate in learning. The third point is we don't have that much evidence in curriculum. Uh, teachers. So in teachers, um, let, me, let me discuss about qualification, the contract of the teacher, and the principals. And in qualification, uh, what we know is that any uh, qualification of the teacher that we measure is not correlated with uh, test scores. So it doesn't matter if the teacher has a master or a PhD or a high school diploma. Apparently, that is not correlated with uh, learning of the kids. The second thing that uh, we, are, we are finding is that teacher development and training is quite ineffective. And <laughs> this is very similar to, uh, to the discussion that Carty was having. Uh, if something, uh, training uh, produces effects when, there is, when it is very intensive, 
and context-based. If it's the type of training that we are observing in a lot of countries in which the teacher is taken out of the school for a half a day, going to a classroom, receive some type of uh, teacher development, that doesn't work. What it works is a long time uh, uh, immersion and content-based, apparently. The, sec the, the, third, uh, the third point is about teacher incentives. Well, my reading of the literature is teachers' uh, incentives works in one way. There is change in behavior. Probably not the behavior that we want to trigger, but there is change in behavior. So if you do the, the incentives, teachers respond, but they respond in different ways. What is the evidence about the results of teacher incentives in terms of uh, learning, in, in terms of test scores? The evidence is very mixed. In one, one set, uh, setup uh, works, in others not. Uh, so it's very mixed. Very mixed. The other one is uh, incentive based on actions on almost full control of the teachers work in the sense that if you provide incentives to teachers to reduce absenteeism, that work. But if you provide incentives to teachers to increase t uh, test scores of children, it doesn't work. The final point is contract teachers may be very effective in, this, in, the, follow in the following way. You have this contract teacher that doesn't have the regular contract and that teacher uh, tried to get the regular contract and that teacher put a lot of effort, uh, it's, uh, it's very effective. The problem is the problem of scal scalability. How do you scale that uh, to immerse that type of program in the whole system? And the role of the principal, we don't have that much evidence. And this is the first flag that I want to, to, to raise is, look, one part of, of, the, of my sense is that we need to start thinking more about the institution of the school rather than at different parts. Something that is very important is that a school is an institution that is a, it's an organism that is alive. And in, when you change something, other parts reform, uh, change. And we need to start thinking about the system more in a, in a system way than uh, changing little parts. The four, uh, my, 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 the four component of my school is inputs. Here, the evidence is more or less clean. The evidence is that more inputs doesn't have any impact in, in learning. If you bring more inputs to the school, that doesn't make uh, the change in, in, in learning. To build new schools, apparently, is very effective increasing enrollment and learning, which is a little bit different from what uh, Carti was saying, because I am thinking about building the whole school, and that is very effective. Uh, if you are right to a location that was not in a school before, and you put on a school, that is very effective. Uh, what about uh, uh, computers? Computers is very tricky, as Kartik was saying. The evidence is that full uh, big uh, type of program like one laptop per child doesn't work. That's the evidence, at least. And the reason is two things. One is that it's very difficult that the teachers use the computer in pedagogy. It's very difficult. Why? Because teaching a teacher is one of the most difficult things in life. And secondly, the computers usually are in these classrooms that are closed. And you don't have access to those computers. But anyway, there is another type of program in computers which is very tailored to kids and very tailored about games and that complement the classroom. Apparently, those programs have some effects. Uh, finally, the governance of the school. The governance of the school, there, I am going to, to discuss three components. One is the private public management, the other one is competition, and the other one is accountability. My evidence, my reading of the evidence is that the private school is very positive. Uh, this is the new evidence. The old evidence was very prone to bias, and, and there was no uh, clear, systematic, or very clean uh, identification strategy. Recent evidence of private school is positive. The other one is competition. competition uh, is, uh, the evidence is very small, and I, again, I think that it points towards positive effects. The problem is that we need to put an eye on sorting. Usually, this type of program vouchers uh, drop the best kids from the public school to the private ones, and that's problematic. And we need to start thinking about the design of this program to try to prevent that type of sorting. The, the, the last point that I want to make is accountability. And accountability can be two things. One is that we put the families to start getting into the school and controlling things in the school. The other one is a government-based accountability in which the school are accountable to produce results. The one about families going to the school, the evidence is positive, but mixed. The one about school government accountability apparently is more positive, 
However, there is a lot of strategic behavior that is triggered by this type of policies. So again, one of the most fundamental points is that we need to start thinking about the strategic responses to the programs that, are with, uh, that we are doing. So finally, my takeaway uh, message, I'm going to, 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 to say two things. One is the following. So the demand side interventions, we, are very, we, we, have, we have been very effective. We have been in a very effective way bringing kids to school. The problem is that learning is very mixed. The second point is supply side intervention. My reading is that it's very mixed. So we, don't, we have different interventions that works in one context and not work in the other one. So what is this asymmetry? Why, why is that asymmetry? This asymmetry, my hypothesis, is the following. In the man side intervention, you have one institution, which is the family, and that family shares some common grounds in different cultures, different countries. And for instance, we know that opportunity cost is a very important factor sending kids uh, to school. When we think about supply side interventions, we have to deal with very idiosyncratic set of institutions, with the schools or the education system. In that context, it's very difficult that the same intervention will work in different contexts. So we need to start thinking carefully about the interaction between the design of the, 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 the programs that we are doing and the institutions that we are facing. Another discussion that for me was very interesting is the discussion about external uh, intervention versus internal ex intervention. External intervention is you do something outside the system and the hope is that what you do outside the system will trigger effects in the system. One example is contract teachers. You don't deal with the regular teachers, you hire contract teachers and the idea is that the contract teacher is going to trigger uh, some effects in the, in the system. The other, the other option is uh, to have internal intervention, which is you arrive and you try to work what exists in the system, and you try to do things with the existing teachers, for instance, teacher development. The, the, that is a tension, and it's something that I think that is important is that we need to start thinking carefully what is the, rela the relationship between external interventions and what it may trigger in the internal uh, system. So external intervention may trigger responses that can be good or bad in the internal system. The other one is, of course, we need to start thinking more about internal, uh, internal system. Finally, what, where do we need more evidence? Teachers. So I, I, I think that teachers is very important and we need to start understanding uh, teachers in two ways. First of all, we know a good teacher when we see her. And it's, the, the, a lot of times, we try to know how, what is a good teacher. And we know a good teacher seeing see her. It's not that there are characteristics that are, well, uh, that are clearly uh, defined, that we can measure uh, clearly, that we say, ah, that's a good teacher. And that's very important, because we need to start thinking, OK, how, what is a good teacher? And secondly, what is a good class? So what, what, what I think that, that we need more evidence is we need to understand more the role of class management and we need to understand more the, the role of pedagogic instruction in the classroom as, as an economist. The second thing is we need to understand what is the technology of producing a very uh, good class. And the third one is we need to understand what is the role of training. We, we don't know very clearly how to train teachers and I think that we need to put more uh, leverage there. Of course, we need to understand better the role of incentives. And I, I finish here, there is a tension between economists and the rest of the world. And the tension is the following. Economists believe seriously in incentives. Economists believe that the problem with this, a lot of this, of this system is that the, the incentives are very distorted. Uh, that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is the, 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 the educator, in which educator says, look, teachers are doing what they can do they are doing the best effort. The problem is they don't have the tools to react to, in to incentives. I think that probably what we need is a middle ground. We need to have middle grounds in which we, try to, we will try to change the incentives of the system, but we will try to give better tools to teachers. And I think that that's uh, where, where, where we need a lot of uh, new evidence. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. Uh, Abhijit, could you talk about um, evidence from India? Um, 
So I, I guess I, I'm an economist as well, but, and, and I will also talk about incentives. I think mostly I won't talk about the incentives that I think Felipe had in mind. I think that's, to me, that's not unimportant, but it sort of, I think, misses, I think, the, the, the place where I think we have most leverage and um, takes on things which, I mean, may well be true that we have to change the whole system, but that whenever say anybody says that, I think of all my Marxist friends from the 70s. So it's, it's the one paralyzing thought I avoid. Um, so I think that uh, the place where I find, so I, I decided that I took the instructions uh, from Tom very seriously. So I decided I'll pick the one thing that I think uh, I would take uh, as the place for intervention. And I, I think that that's a combination of incentives but in, uh, and I think misguided thinking, but in, 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 in a way that I think is not, um, maybe not emphasized enough. Suddenly when the word gets, incentive gets there, you start thinking private schools, uh, contract teachers, etc. I think all of those things are important. I think what is, I think the, what the most striking factor of private schools is how bad they are. I think that's a first order fact. When you look at the, you know, I think, at least in India, I'm, I'm just going to stick to India uh, and actually Pakistan, which I know a little bit about. But I, uh, uh, the, the result, I think the first order fact is that the difference between the performance of private and perform public schools is much smaller than a whole range of interventions in these schools, the impact of a whole range of in small interventions. So. To, to um, maybe the reason, if, I mean, I think this, my reading of the study that Karthik and Michael did, the one, I, I think, credible study I've seen of the effect of vouchers in South Asia, is that there is no clear effect of private schools, that private schools are n not obviously any better. They do some things differently, but that's a, uh, I think they certainly do different things, and uh, maybe they do, they're more efficient, they, uh, certainly they are much cheaper. So the thing that I think about private schools that I would say is clearly true is that the social cost uh, or the cost to, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the government if it paid for vouchers would be substantially lower than what it pays for schools. So it's, it's as a direct fact, I think the big difference is not at all in performance but in, in pay. Um, Private schools are cheaper. They seem to have, they seem to do more things. Do they do better on average? I think the average results suggest to me that they do no better. Um, it's more complicated than that. But and you may may have heard Karthik about it. So I, I'll. Uh, I think what's striking about that is the fact that it, they don't. I mean, if we believe in all these things about the incentives, why aren't they doing better? I mean, after all, we, there's this whole stereotype of the Indian government teacher who's uh, lackadaisical, never attends, and when he attends, drinks tea. So why don't these private school teachers uh, do much, much better? I mean, that's sort of the puzzle, is that, you know, why don't they do so much better? And, you know, maybe you can stretch the, if you take the kind of, to me, the, the, you know, other than this, this, uh, this uh, voucher study where, where, where they really don't find much, much. If you look at the effects in the, in just the ASA data, the national data, put in family fixed effects, compare siblings who go to different schools. That's a, surely an overestimate of the effect. That turns out to be, you know, modest sized difference between private, same siblings who are going to private public school. That's almost sure an overestimate of the effect because families when they send the pr a child to sc private school are also favoring the child in other ways. So I think first order, uh, if that effect, if I had to compare that effect, I, there's a number of um, studies I've been part of where you get effects from very small interventions where twice to three times that size. So why aren't, why is it so small? That's the, I think the puzzling factor of private schools. And I, let me give, and I think the answer goes back to incentives. I think throughout the system, the incentives are wrong. And the reason why the incentives are wrong is very simple. I think everybody in the system believes that the point of the school is to deliver the syllabus. That's how 
indeed the right to education law in India writes that as part of the law. That, you know, the right to education law says, if you don't deliver the syllabus, you can go to court. So it, it, I think, and that obsession with the syllabus, I think is, I think, uh, you know, both private schools and, and, and government schools are subject to that. Indeed, parents are subject to that. Everybody believes in the syllabus. Problem is that the syllabus is said by some people who have some, no doubt, uh, noble ideal of education in mind, but have no connection with the reality on the ground. So you have a bunch of first generation learners. You have a system which is completely without any uh, even instrument for stopping children for, from grade progression. So you don't check, you don't look at whether children are, are actually able to master the material. You just let them go through the system. Um, a, a result of that system is that teachers don't feel any compulsion to, and I think they're right because the system is asking them to deliver the syllabus. I don't blame them in that sense. Uh, to actually address the needs of the children rather than the needs of the syllabus. So I think the entire system, the incentives in the system, private and public, is to focus on, on the syllabus, the sort of goals set by the syllabus rather than whether the children are getting anything out of it. This is why you have the phenomenon of children in third grade who cannot read. I don't think that's a that's a mechanical fact. I mean, you know, if you, you you it's not that you couldn't design a system where every child could read in third grade. I don't think it's a matter of revolution in in education technology. It's not about rethinking schools. It's just about focusing on that. We, we have a number of of randomized control trials we've done. All of them involved either volunteers or other high school educated people who were paid either zero or. $5 or $20 or some nominal amount of money. Look at the effects of that. It's, they, have, they generate much bigger gains than switching to private school. That, you know, two, two hours a week for six weeks of training with somebody who has a high school degree does more than putting in all, all, the, all the incentives in the system. That just, that fact should be, sort of the first order fact we uh, grapple with, and it has to say that we are not actually trying to solve, the, the system is trying to do something very different from what we're trying to, uh, we want it to do. It's not a system that has the average child in its, in, in its focus. I think it's a system that starts from the idea that if you can't deliver the whole syllabus to the child, then you have failed. Therefore, you, you're willing to give up on children rather than the syllabus. I think that, that core fact explains, I think, most of what we observe in the failure, is my view. Then there are lots of other things that could be done better, but there's, a, there's some easy wins which we don't get. And the reason why we don't get it is because the whole system doesn't want, or doesn't demand that that's what gets delivered. So I, I, I'll, I'll stop there. That seems to me to be one place where we could intervene easily and and uh, maybe, maybe we, we, if we understood better why that doesn't happen, we could actually make some progress. Thanks, Abhijit. <laughs> Fernando, if you could please make your comments. Thank you for the invitation to be in this panel. So I was asked to share some thoughts on what kind of knowledge could help us improve education in a large public education system. And so the remarks I'm going to offer start making the distinction between technical education problems and adaptive education problems. And just to explain the difference, a technical problem is one where there is agreement on what the problem is, and knowledge can find a solution, knowledge of the facts to that problem. An adaptive problem is one where there isn't agreement among a number of people affected by the problem as to what the problem is or the priority of it. So to give you an example, I recently spent a little bit of time in India visiting schools and talking to innovators. And uh, one of the programs I visited uh, was a program trying to uh, get, cause schools to develop climates where people related to one another more humanely. And the theory of those in the pro uh, uh, involved in that program is that relationships in public schools, in very poor communities in that area, are such that the emotional and social development of the kids um, is really not adequate. Now, whether that should be a bigger priority than advancing the mathematic achievement of children is obviously not a technical question. Uh, 
whether uh, people should pay more attention to how everyone in India thinks about the rights of women and men and what the role of schools, institutions should be in doing that is obviously not a technical issue. And what priority this should have over attending to the basic goals of the curriculum in mathematics and science, that is something that is normally in democratic societies sorted out through the deliberative process. Research can contribute in revealing problems that may have been invisible to elites, uh, particularly in societies where elites do not have a lot of personal experiences connecting with public institutions that serve a lot of people. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing I wanted to say is that there is a difference between evaluating what is and assessing sort of the marginal differences between the alternatives we have in place versus the task of designing an innovation for improvement. I spent the rest of the, mo the morning today at a big conference at Harvard, part of HILT, an initiative to cause many of us to rethink uh, what teaching and learning should be in this university. And, mo and this is an initiative in which we are spending sizable resources um, and supporting a lot of experimentation. Uh, most of our conversation this morning was about what kinds of goals should direct our teaching. Should we emphasize the ability of our students to do as opposed to to be, to produce things, to create things as opposed to, to gain knowledge? Should we emphasize the capacity to deliberate over existing knowledge? And those trade-offs uh, are sorted out in a conversation that is about a vision for a society, for a democratic society, and a vision of what leadership ought to be, and what the role of an institution that is trying to educate leaders should be in a society. So for example, I find that there is a, a lot of interest in the OCDE, for example, um, helping them make a proposal to the Board of Governors about how is it that we measure 21st century skills, and how do we go beyond uh, literacy, mathematics, and science, because there is a sense uh, in some of these economies that uh, in order to build innovation and knowledge-based economies, we're going to have to pay attention to more than the cognitive dimensions and outcomes of education. We have to pay attention to the intrapersonal development of people, the capacity to gov for people to govern themselves, as well as to their interpersonal skills. And there is a sense in some quarters that those two buckets, traditionally neglected in educational institutions, might in fact be even more important than the cognitive dom uh, domains in an era where access to a lot of knowledge is free and widely available. So having said that, then, do I have time to read my paper? How much sure. time do I have? Let me share a few thoughts then on the difference between a focus on improvement and design and invention versus a focus on studying what is. I think there is no linear path between understanding the world as it is, particularly when one has the sense that the current state of school is broken. As our provost said this morning as a way to motivate us to engage in this kind of deliberation, his view was higher education is broken. This system cannot be fixed by marginal tinkering. It's broken financially. It's broken in terms of who it serves. It's broken in terms of how the society perceives that we add value to the problems of society. Um, and so I think at best, uh, the kind of evidence that either cross-national studies or even experimental studies can generate can help us understand which factors relate or cause particular outcomes, but they don't necessarily tell us uh, how do we produce um, on a grand scale new conditions, different conditions of the kinds of things that those of you who connect with the Innovation Lab, for example, or with the President Challenge to Promote Innovation would understand. Uh, producing uh, engineering and, and invention uh, requires making some leaps of inferences and requires going beyond what is known, uh, what is known scientifically, and filling those gaps in knowledge um, with what I would call as bets, bets which can then be evaluated, obviously. Uh, I also think that a focus on improvement at a large scale requires some attention to the factors that are likely to produce organizational learning and inspire uh, those who need to change their practice. Uh, now, I think this is well understood in the field of, of health, of health science, where there is an approach for a call largely the study of positive deviance, which, which assumes people are more likely to be uh, motivated to change if you can help identify uh, examples that already point 
to what the future is than if you simply over obsess on the pathologies and all the dysfunctions of the current system because it's hard for most people to understand how do you go from being convinced or hyper convinced that the current system is broken to saying now I know what I need to do to make this system uh, work. So let me suggest that the kind of knowledge that, um, that incomplete knowledge uh, as the kind of knowledge that, uh, in the end, a traveling sales salesman, for those who are familiar with that example, needs to depend on to finally get the task done of visiting a lot of cities on a little time. Um, the kind of incomplete and imperfect knowledge that, uh, that we need to improve education, I think, fits in the following categories. Um, first, I obviously miscalculated how much I was going to be able to <laughs> say in 10 minutes. So first, I think we need to understand how educational institutions relate to other social institutions. And this includes understanding how a societies and various groups within a society value education, what about education they value, what are the continuities and the discontinuities between how schools do their work and the values, expectations, and norms of families and communities, and understand what groups of the population participate in educational institutions and with what consequences for those who participate and for those who are out. Now, understanding educational institutions also includes that we know what broad purposes they serve in addition to the stated purposes of educating children. For example, in some societies, public education systems, particularly as you move up to the higher levels, uh, are used to reward political loyalty and to support political parties or groups or to favor uh, particular ethnic groups. In some societies, educational institutions are one of the mechanisms through which various forms of segregation are practiced along socioeconomic, political, ethnic, racial, and religious divides. And generating a knowledge and a good understanding of that process is fundamental as a way to inform a conversation about what is the role of education in a society, particularly if, if it's a society that aspires to be democratic, which assumes a fundamental equality among all people and among their basic rights and, and dignity. So in some societies, there are different forms of bribes and gifts which are extracted from students and from parents to have access to the best schools, to the best teachers, or to receive special attention. And knowledge about the pervasiveness of these practices and of their consequences in sorting different students into different streams or in excluding particular groups from education is fundamental to understand how educational institutions relate to the larger social institutions and to culture. It's very important to understand what different groups in society expect of schools and how happy they are with the way in which schools function at present. Um, let me skip the examples. Second kind of knowledge that I think is important uh, is to understand how education institutions function and what is learned in them. Who teaches, in what way, with what technology, with what pedagogy, what is the curriculum? What uh, of these uh, three buckets that I mentioned, cognitive, interpersonal, intrapersonal, what is it that schools are trying to do in the first place? And is that adequate to uh, the requirements of the larger social institutions where the school is embedded? Um, with what organization, with what governance, at what cost, and obviously who pays. We need to know what is the effectiveness, certainly, of schools at developing cognitive, but also social and emotional competencies. And we need to know what are these learning environments like. We need to know how pervasive in this country there is increasing, and I think adequate, attention to bullying and other forms of social violence, which uh, have very important consequences in the kids. I would imagine that uh, this is something that any society that values the social and healthy emotional development of people would be interested in having access to that kind of knowledge and sweeping that under the carpet, under the pretense that just looking at the intended goals of the curriculum, if those are the, the, to foster the cognitive development, is in some ways to take a stance and to assume that, and to assume that there is a technical answer to something that is really not a technical problem, a question of how important um, those competencies are. Uh, Fernando, um, uh, one, so uh, two, more, two more buckets then of things. So second thing is, uh, third, very important to, um, to in, in, based on a good understanding of the relationship between education institutions and, and their social context and their effectiveness, we certainly need to know the impact of different interventions deliberately designed to improve the effectiveness of schools, and we've heard plenty about that, so I will, uh, I will skip that. I think we also need knowledge about the process of change itself. Knowing how institutions vary uh, does not tell us anything about how do we get a system to go from A to B unless we study the process of change itself. 
And certainly change to foster inclusion and reducing inequity doesn't follow automatically from knowledge of the facts on what needs to do to promote equity. Uh, programs are designed, implemented, and scale up because there are leaders who make this happen. And those leaders operate in organizational and political contexts. And we need to study those if we want to have any understanding of how do we help to produce this change on a large scale. Um, so I think leadership, the study of leadership itself and of, ch and of change is a very important piece. So let me conclude then. The knowledge that can help us close equity gaps in education is knowledge that is relevant to clear purpose. And those need to reflect clear thinking about the relationship of educational institutions to social institutions and about the way in which developing cognitive, emotional, and social competencies allow people to become self-authoring individuals and contributing members of their communities. This knowledge should focus on broad areas of studying the relationship of educational institutions to their context, studying the functioning of educational institutions, examining the impact of educational process, and studying the process of educational innovation and change itself and the role of leadership in that process. Now that knowledge should draw on multiple disciplinary and methodological traditions and provide the foundations for a process of design and implementation of interventions that have to go beyond the automatic adaptation of, of these research findings. Um, I think that there, there's every reason to be hopeful about the fact that these things are possible. If you look at the history of education, major break breakthroughs have not been produced any other way. Major breakthroughs have been produced when individuals created some discontinuities with the past and produced new designs. Uh, think about Pestalozzi developing a new approach and uh, challenging Lancaster in how it is that kids should be educated. Uh, we see examples of that in public and in private schools around the world. And to my mind, uh, the most interesting conversations about change um, focus precisely in this, in this domain. Thanks. Um, I just have one question for each of the panelists, and I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, Felipe, Vijit talked about the fact that incentives don't work, uh, even for the private schools. Uh, he says that private schools don't actually do a whole lot better than government schools. Um, I thought, Abhijit, that was the case for mostly the low-income private schools. So, um, but you, you talked about private schools as if it's the average private school. So, uh, you know, why are government teachers, first of all, we know that 70% of government teachers in certain states send their children to private school. They are insiders in the system. They're not stupid. So they, they probably know better than any researcher in the world as to which system is working better. So, Felipe, I, my question really is for you, not for Abhijit, in terms of, do you believe him when he says that the incentives aren't working in, in the private system? <laughs> of course I believe him. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, the private sector, usually people believe that is one uh, of the elite, and that's it. Uh, in us usually in developing countries, there are two modes of private sector, one that, uh, that reach to the very a low income communities, one that reached to the very high income communities, and those are two different animals. Uh, I think that that clearly uh, per, 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 per the, the efficiency of the private sector per dollar expense is more higher than the, the private sector, than the public uh, sector, uh, per dollar invested in, in education. Uh, there are, the, 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 the debate is very tricky, of course, because people sort into these different uh, type of uh, schools and to try to assess what is, uh, what is the value added of a school is very difficult. And I, I, I agree that, that what is puzzling is that uh, given, given the, the, that there is this private school that, that, that has more freedom and that has more uh, uh, language to, to make decisions, uh, why they are not producing a higher test and, 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 and clearly one of the things that, that we need to understand is how is the technology in these schools producing uh, learning. Uh, and, and, and I totally agree, it's, it's, it's an interesting point and, and I think that, that has, is a very important point. Uh, Abhijit, um, you mentioned that there are certain small interventions that actually uh, are much more significant than the shift from, say, uh, than just the incentives in the private sector. In particular, you talked about you know, using uh, high school graduates. Uh, I think what you were suggesting is tutoring or remedial uh, education. So could you talk about how the government would implement something like this at scale to improve the quality of education in India? So, I mean, I think the, 
there, there are two separate pieces to that uh, question. One is, um, I think there's a, I think the government faces two constraints. One is the court system. The court system in India is extraordinarily um, willing to take economic decisions without consideration of anything other than its own, um, I think its own sense of what is just. Um, and so for, I think, so I want to set that aside. So I don't think, so there are two que there's a second question, which is practically how can, can you do it? So the reason why I bring out the court system is that part of the problem in India is whenever you try to do this, people go to court and say, we, we are doing the same work as teachers, so you have to pay us as much. And so part of the problem is you have to keep them outside the school. You can't actually bring them inside the school. So as soon as you do it, the courts immediately decide that you have to pay them whatever the teachers get paid. And so no government wants to take it on. So I think to the extent that we don't, at some day we have to tell the courts to shut up, otherwise we're going to not be able to function. I think that's completely uh, fundamental to our problem right now. The courts are overreached and overreached and overreached and um, we haven't managed to tell them to shut up uh, yet. Uh, now, having said that, um, practically it's not that difficult. I mean, I mean, if you look at the, um, the first of these studies we did. These were all actually in Bombay municipal schools, if all of L Ward, which is you know, bigger than Boston in terms of a school system, had it, uh, had these balsa case coming to the schools. So it wasn't that small. I mean, the, you know, we're talking about India, when you said small interventions, uh, you know, the small intervention we study are all of the state of Bihar, which is of course half the population of the US. So it's not that small, I mean, you know. Uh, so, I mean, small meaning, I think it's more small, not in scale. So I don't think the question is that difficult, it's not that difficult to scale these. I mean, I think what is really difficult is, is more, so sorry, tell me two things. One is the word small I meant, not so much that the intervention itself was sort of, across few schools. I meant the intervention itself was not hugely resourced. There was just one small thing you changed. So in thousands of schools, actually. And now we're doing similar thing in, uh, you know, the center chunk of Uttar Pradesh. And Uttar Pradesh is, is you know, two-thirds the size of the US. So it's, it's, not, it's not small in that sense. Uh, it's small in the sense that it's not system changing. It's, it's, it's incremental, I, that's the... Fernando, um, I know you were talking about um, the role of education in, uh, institutions in the 21st century, but I'd just like you to, to bring you back to your experience from Latin America. Could you maybe talk about, you know, in the case of Brazil, how has the fact that they, several years ago, put in place an assessment system, they've got this basic education index, you know, some of the things that they've created, the tools, the mechanisms, which we don't have in India as yet, and the focus on measuring learning outcomes. How much of a difference did that, did that make? I will be glad to talk about that, but before I do, one thing that was in my mind as you were talking about public and private schools is, in what outcomes is the evidence based on the superiority of public and private? Because um, I spent a little bit of time with several hundred school leaders of private schools in Mumbai, and I had the sense that those individuals had rather sophisticated aspirations for the kinds of um, social competencies that the schools should develop. And I wonder whether what we know, in fact, I, 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 I know that what we know about the differences between public and private is, rather, is limited to a rather narrow set of academic outcomes. Um, and I think it's important to understand that uh, the other civic outcomes are not byproducts of the academic. For example, if you take the rankings that come from the PISA studies in the three cognitive domains that have been assessed with the rankings that come from the civic education study, that relationship is orthogonal. Finland does very well on cognitive, not so well on civic. Now, is that a problem? Depends. When you, I just finished a paper looking at data from the World Value Survey, where I see that a quarter of the population in Finland really would have a hard time um, having as a neighbor someone of a different religion, ethnicity, and so on. And if you think that those are requirements for a society that is increasingly more diverse, 
uh, in my view, these are outcomes that schools should intend to deliver. By the way, the U.S. is no better in that respect. In fact, most of the industrialized world has real problems in terms of equipping pe people with the basic expectation that divides ethnic, religious, gender-wise, and so on are irrelevant in their view of who has rights and so on. But to answer your question on Brazil, um, I think Brazil began to tackle the problem of reform in an adaptive way, not as a technical way, producing a political consensus uh, initially within the government leads and then with the private sector. So someone you and I know well was instrumental, a business leader in Brazil was instrumental in convening a meeting of elites, by which I mean economic, civic, and political elites, and causing them to take responsibility for the improvement of education and causing them to engage in some collective action in saying, we all love to have our little foundations here and to do our own things and have our names attached to them, but the only way we're going to move the needle is if we work with the public sector, we check our egos at the door, and we agree on three or four goals that, uh, that can help us improve. And it was within that context. One of the goals, of course, was let's begin to assess outcomes and let's benchmark our national systems of assessment with instruments like PISA. And let's, they may have gone a little bit too far, let's define specific goals of improvement per school in the country on a yearly basis. But at the same time, they also said, let's make sure that we create a context that is supportive of innovation. And they began to build social capital, essentially, to convene entrepreneurs and to build an ecosystem for them in the private sector that uh, created, I guess you would call them, incentives for those individuals to pay attention to improvement in the public schools. So I, if there is a lesson from Brazil that I think may be relevant to other large systems, including this country, it's that um, there was a pact of elites in the country who agreed to A, take responsibility for the improvement of education, B, engage in some action that was greater than what each of them could do individually. And they also agreed, certainly those who orchestrated this meeting, to check their egos at the door, which is, I realize, a very complicated 21st century skill to understand. How do you get people <laughs> to check their egos at the door and to say, we're going to collaborate these 200 people in pooling resources, in funding a collective enterprise, in working with the government and letting the government take all the credit for all these efforts, even though we're doing a big chunk of that. So I could talk in more detail if you want about the Brazil experience. Thank you. We'd like to open it up for uh, a Q&A. Please go ahead. So uh, I want to ask a question that will help me grapple with a problem that I always worry about. I mean, I worry about it now largely because both Felipe, thank you, uh, both Felipe and Fernando kind of reminded me about the importance of thinking not only about schools as institutions, but thinking about schools as organizations in local contexts, both local contexts. Oh, I don't know how to all righty. So um, I'm pretty loud. Can you hear? Okay. So, but thinking about schools as organizations in local contexts, both communities, but local contexts in terms of the social dynamics inside of schools. And when I start to think about that, it makes me really worried about what it means to go from descriptive evidence of average effects in studies to generalized prescriptions for what we should do in policy. Because what works on the ground in local contexts varies in lots of ways that we don't understand well from average effects. And I just always want help trying to say, how do we take what we think we know on average on large scale studies and try to actually make them work on the ground when we have a lot of reasons to suspect from mixed results, from interaction effects, that it might not, the things we prescribe might not really work well across lots of different contexts. Felipe, do you want Fernando? to ask? You know what works, so you should take <laughs> this question. <laughs> so uh, probably I will, I will answer uh, with two ideas. The one is that Abhijit was thinking about small changes uh, that are not small in the sense that uh, they, they are not important. They are, let's say, in the margin, but that, that can have a very strong impact. Uh, that's that's one, one, one way to, to start pushing the agenda is, okay, let's try to, 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 to change this margin that is very well 
thought and, and very, very, uh, you know what you are doing, and probably that margin will 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 apply to any context or, or not. That's that's one way to proceed. The other way is that th there are big reforms that that change the whole institution or the whole organism, and and those changes are very difficult to track for certain difference. Uh, one is that you 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 when you have big reforms, you you are changing a lot of things. When you think about charter school, charter school has a lot of components that makes a charter, and those components, the, the, the sum of those components is not the whole, and, and, and several of those components may be uh, uh, institutional specific. And, 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 and that's the problem with big reforms, with, with package of reform, uh, to try to, 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 to extrapolate to other, to other systems. One way that people are, are doing right now this type of evidence is to try to, to do reforms uh, or uh, implement programs that has uh, different different variations. So you have three or four variations of the same of the same of the same uh, package, and uh, they try to analyze first of all which variation will give the, will give the impacts and what interactions of, of them are, are important. So it's a piecewise approach. The problem is when, when you have a lot of uh, interventions and a lot of variations, uh, you need to have the scale to, to, to do these, these, these things. But uh, your question is a tough one. Your, uh, in, and more general, your question about external validity, how do we replicate in different contexts, is a tough one. And, and we are, we are, we are, we, we, it's, it's very difficult to answer because uh, one, one way is to do it, let's do the same experiment in different contexts to see if it works. You close your finger, it works, fine. But a lot of the time it doesn't work, so it's specific to the context. And, and then you are trying to say, okay, what are the specificities of the context that allow me to explain this evaluation? And, and there is a lot of a structural model that try to find the question of, okay, what are the conditions under which this uh, intervention works? But it's a tough cookie. Hmm. Can, can, can we just, yeah, thanks. Maybe get another can, question can, in there. Can I speak to the question yeah, sure. briefly? Because I, I think your question is the most important question in education. You probably were at ARA, as was I, 14,000 people. The theme of the conference this year was what do we know about education and poverty and about how education can break the cycle of poverty? I was on a panel that was looking at the role of academic research in helping us understand that. And one of the panelists said it best when he said, we're very good at deconstructing and breaking, taking Humpty Dumpty apart. We're not so good at constructing, putting Humpty Dumpty back together. And if you extrapolate from that, the idea is we know that good education at the local level is a system. And it's a system where a number of conditions are inter interdependent, right? curriculum with high aspirations, teachers that are well prepared, students that are fed and healthy and so on. When we study average effects, the notion is everything else being equal. But at the local level, everything else is not equal. And so what I draw from that is investing in school leadership and promoting the capacity of those who work in the school to make that contextualization, to make the adaptation that is going to allow them to compensate for the fact that very few things are, are equal is fundamental. I don't know if you were in the talk that uh, this visitor from Tel Aviv gave yesterday. She's running this outstanding school, highly poor kids from 40 different countries, right? How do you take anything that we know from educational research and translate it into usable knowledge for this woman who has to educate 40 kids speaking 40 different languages with all kinds of marginalization and so on? My takeaway is we need to invest a lot more knowledge and development in the professional capacity of the leader of that institution and of the professionals who are going to work with them making those adaptations. Hi, my question is for, for Professor Banerjee. Uh, I'm very interested in understanding the policy implication of the evidence that we've been hearing uh, this morning around contract teachers that they produce uh, similar or slightly better uh, learning outcomes among students at a lower cost. It is a more cost effective solution. Uh, as a group, what is our vision for uh, teachers administratively in the next 10 years? We know that two states in India, Madhya Pradesh and Bihar, have dying cadres, which means they are only hiring contract teachers now. Are we hoping that in the next 10 years, we are going to have, we want to only have contract teachers across India and then figure out, as Karthik was speaking this morning, figure out a way to regularize them on the basis of their performance? Or are we looking at uh, contract teachers as an interim arrangement uh, that they exist till we train 
provide good, qual good quality training to our teachers. And if that's the case, then how do we handle questions around the political economy of education and exactly the question that you were referring to, which is strong teacher unions and uh, state governments struggling to deal with teachers, uh, contract teachers who want to, to regularize themselves. Uh, just interested in your, hearing your views. So, uh, I mean, there's a, you, you, you could be asking about my prediction or you could be asking about what I think should happen. Uh, and those are separate. My prediction is that not much will change in this dimension. Um, I think what's, going to, what's ha already beginning to happen, in fact, what's interesting is that basically, we, we, I think what's going to happen, my prediction is that what will happen is what's happened in the healthcare system. Well, the healthcare system at the the sub-center and the health center level, which is at the, um, basically at the panchayat level, so large villages. Um, the health system is essentially, everybody has access to free health care and nobody uses it. That's the first approximation. So 20% of all visits to, by the poorest people are to government health facilities even though they have a government facility within one kilometer. So basically that's what's going to happen. We're going to keep paying these teachers and nobody will go to these schools. That's my prediction on what's going to happen. Everybody's going to exit from the system, but nobody's going to stop. So, but we'll, we won't actually ever get to the point where we can, so everybody's, everybody who can will exit from the system, send their children to private school. Whether or not, that's a good idea. They're going to, f and then we're going to keep paying the teachers uh, because we can't actually do anything about it. That, that's what's happened in the healthcare system, that the healthcare system has reached that ideal state of essentially perfect <laughs> non-delivery. Um, and I think that's what's going to happen in, uh, in education. So that's my prediction. Now, on terms of what should happen, I, I, I think that, I think that sort of, I think clearly the idea that, you know, there should be some people who get paid a lot less will do all the teaching while some people will sit at home uh, precisely because the other people who, who should be doing the teaching don't do it is kind of patently unacceptable. Now, the reason why governments have gone there is precisely because they have failed to provide incentives for the people within the system. So clearly what should happen is, is that the, the, there should be one civil service, a single civil service, where these things are, the incentives are changed. Now, that seems like an ideal that's very difficult to reach. Uh, my, that's why my prediction is a very pessimistic one, which is that nothing will change in the system. Uh, but I'll, I, I, uh, I hope I'm wrong. Tarun? So I want to I just replay back what I thought I heard from Abhijit and Fernando, because to me, they were at completely different levels, right? So Fernando, am I understanding you correctly that when you say they are, as you started out, there are these technical issues, and then I don't know what the term was for adaptive, adaptive issues. Adapt, uh, adaptive issues. Is it your contention that both these should be treated simultaneously in the school system, oh, yeah. or is there, a, is there some prior sense yeah, in which you have to... Yeah, but we should not confuse we should not try to find technical solutions for adaptive issues until we have resolved but, them but, first. Yeah. But, but that's, a diff that's slightly different. So yeah. is it I think both the, should be treated, yes. The accept, the, what I'm understanding from Kartik, who gave this overview before, and Abhijit's many studies, and Felipe's, is that we're mostly measuring much more functional outcomes, perhaps because those are easier to measure, whether you can read the things like that, whether the teachers show up, um, which are unlikely to get to some of these adaptive issues you're talking about. So one rationalization could be that, and this is the part that I'm not sure about, is it, is it that until you can read a paragraph, add a two-digit number, that that takes primacy over some of the other issues, or you, you reject no, that? Not in my mind. I, not I in reject mind. that. I think you can, we have entire education systems uh, that, I mean, it would be equivalent to saying in business schools, you need to teach people the technical skills of business before you teach them ethics. Well, in some ways, that's what our business schools have been doing. Well, that's for a what we've been doing. That's for the problem we have. <laughs> that's what, yeah, so we've been doing. I don't think that sequencing them in that way leads to a society that I would want to live in. Abhijit, yeah. do you have something to say? Then I, I, I must say that I, uh, I think there's a 
to me, to me, this is a this conversation suffers from a little bit from um, sort of I think a sense of the ground reality in India, which is where I, th I think I th I, I I think I mean, I, it seems to me that I think I don't disagree with the general principle yeah. that these things are all important, but I, I don't think one can um, one can deliver anything in a school system where children are going to basically, you know, their level of non-participation in the system. So you can't, you cannot deliver, engage them in any way if they feel that the school system is entirely not speaking to them. And I think if you look at having spent lots of time in rural schools in various parts of India, I would say that two-thirds of the children have no idea what's going on. No idea, meaning literally no idea. I mean, there's, they're just ritually present. There's, there's something going on on the wall. They are looking at it. It means nothing to them whatsoever. I, 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 and so in that sense, I don't think you can create a sense of either moral understanding or any other societal uh, understanding in a setting where people are so dramatically excluded. I think you have to bring them on onto the stage first before you can talk to them about anything. They're not being talked to. Right now they just happen to be, it's a form of baby, babysitting for, for them, uh, for their parents. They, they send the children to the schools, they don't actually learn anything. Uh, and they leave at some point. But let me ask you a question, Abhijit. Don't you think there is a risk? I have spent very little time in India. Um, I can tell you the little time I spent and the schools that I visited did not appear to me to be very different from the schools I saw in Pakistan 25 years ago. And I was surprised about that because I know the level of investment is rather different. But don't you think there is a risk that if we sequence educational goals in a way that begins, say, with literacy, in a system, let's, let's assume that indeed the way teachers and principals treat children in certain areas is, is less than humane, is authoritarian, and is hurtful. Um, if we say, well, let's make sure they teach, and we're going to define literacy as number of words that children can read per minute using this particular test and understanding, and let's place very uh, high stakes on these teachers. So they actually produce kids to do that without addressing the question of how easy the people treat each other. Don't you think there is a way that, yeah, maybe the kids will learn how to read more words per minute, but they're going to try to run away from those institutions as fast as they possibly can because it's a place that mistreats them and they get it. I think they, right now the school system, it isn't, I mean, my point is that I think the worst thing you could do to a child is ignore her completely. I think what the school system does now is not that it brutalizes children. I think that that happens, but that happens in as much in these low. That happened as much in the school I went to as in these schools. In fact, my school was a kind of a uh, textbook case of how to not build uh, social relations. I would say. Um, it, I think, and I don't disagree with it, but I think the, for these people, I think this is entirely a piece of fraud. They have no engagement with it, so you cannot deliver anything to them. You cannot, it's not that the relation, changing the relations with somebody who never looked in the eye. The teacher teaches the front, the three children in the front, everybody else sits at the back. The right. reason so why teacher-student ratios don't matter is because you go from 20 to 60 to 200, it doesn't make a difference, you're talking to three. Uh, and so the, everybody else is irrelevant. Well, let, uh, let me share something which is only an anecdote. It's not social science. But uh, because I changed my mind about this program, I think it's relevant. One of the innovations I went to visit was an innovation, the Gandhi Fellows, that takes um, college graduates and sends them to a fairly poor village for two years and tells these fellows, you're going to work with these principles essentially so they improve the emotional climate of the school. I have to tell you that I was very skeptical coming in about the value of such a thing uh, for a number of reasons. I thought, how is this 40-some principal going to pay any attention to this urban kid who's 20-something? What does this 20-something know about improving the school? But I did change my mind. Uh, I thought, maybe in this context, this is a very smart bet. 
because until these people can treat each other as individuals, until someone welcomes these kids and listens to them, and this is what the Gandhi fellows are trying to do, to teach the teachers, listen to the kid, make the kid want to be into the school. It makes no sense to teach them anything on top of that. So it's an anecdote. I have no oh, yeah, empirical yeah. evidence other than my own observations. But I can tell you that I profoundly changed my mind about the value of interventions of that sort, in part because I did not expect to hear so many people tell me that there are deep social dysfunctions in the schools in India and how humans relate to one another, that there are serious problems with, with anger uh, in how individuals connect with one another. Again, this is an observation based on what I have heard, but I would be curious if I had to do any empirical work, I'd like to know how do people think about each other? How is it that um, you know, men and women think about each other in terms of their rights and treating themselves? I would think this is something worth studying. I don't disagree. I mean, I, I, I think we, we, I think we aren't saying very different things. My point is only that I think these Gandhi fellows, part of what they do is actually they make it salient to, to, uh, to teach, or at least bring into the education system everyone but the, you know, the three uh, gifted children. I think that's part of what they do, and part of that. Then you could say that they, this is mediated through conversations about how people should treat each other. But I suspect it would just as well could be just as well be mediated about these kids actually need to learn something. Mm. E any of those things would change things. Yeah. I, I, I think there is a there's a kind of radical uh, dissociation that the school system seems to perfectly accommodate, which I find stunning, mm. I mean, you know. Mm. We have time for one or two more questions. Any other? Tarun? Uh, Mike, uh, my question is to Professor Banerjee, and like if the evidence is uh, overwhelming on that the curriculum doesn't cater to the learning levels of students, what then is the political economy in India that is against curricular reform? If, if it's just a technical fix that I could solve uh, the problem. Why isn't that there's a movement to change curriculum which is in sync with uh, students' learning levels? So uh, I'm going to uh, go on my favorite rant, so I'll, let me restrain myself. Uh, I think, actually, it's an extraordinary, the pol political economy is extraordinary because the education establishment in India, uh, the NCERT and its expert group, uh, have wield extraordinary amount of power, and uh, they uh, and these people. Are, this is a group of people from um, who were who um, sort of uh, have a very clear sense of the education they want to deliver, and their view is. I think it's, it's not a. And I think the reason why it's hard to engage them in a conversation is just you tell them what I was saying. They'll say, you mean you're, you want, you know, you know no, that your child will go to a private school, a good private school, and learn something much better. So you want these children to get cut-rate education. And as soon as you say that, you say, of course not. So it's, it's an extremely powerful instrument they have. They accuse you of sort of moral double standards. And without, and they have, uh, so as soon as you bring up the idea that in the end education should be, I mean, we need to re recognize the reality on the ground, they'll say, what do you mean your children will get a different education from other children? My answer is they actually will, but that's whatever you do. In fact, they'll, right now at least, um, now, right now, my children are getting, or my my brother's children are getting much much better education than uh, these kids, and these kids are getting nothing. Maybe in a different system, they're going to get something, and that's better. But that's that's that. It's very hard to fight that uh, argument. It's very hard because you immediately get accused of a certain, uh, you know, c certain cynicism about the system, which uh, clearly is not defensible. And and uh, and. So they, they have they have the rhetorical uh, upper hand and uh, and I they, I think they do damage every day all the time. Uh, but uh, one last question, Anju. No, I think uh, we were having this debate just now. Should we look at cognitive development first and multiplication, or should we look at ethical development? 
And I think as members of the Harvard community, um, I think both what Harvard prescribes to, as well as what some of the latest research, if you look at things like the center of the developing child, I think we're all believers of holistic development and the power of holistic development. Um, both for the potential it develops in people, as well as the experience can actually create a joy for learning that you want to learn for life, right? Now, if, if that's the premise and you take it to the Indian context, I've been visiting certain schools to look at, you know, what is world-class K-12 education and visiting some of the best K-12 schools. And you're absolutely right, Fernando. You go to the best schools, and I went to the best school in Lucknow, and there you have a student who's on his knees, you know, reading from a board because he's been naughty, embarrassed by the class, and this is something which you see pervasively across the school. Um, so how do we bring about change? Because this change is not just about a syllabus, but it's about a certain mindset towards the way we think about relationships or, or um, a culture in a school. And I think that comes down to actually looking at what kind of leadership do you have in the school, which you talked about, and, and what kind of principles do you have in the school. Until now in the conversation, we've not talked that much about principle development. Felipe, you mentioned it very briefly. Uh, neither did Karthik in the morning talk about it, and I was curious what you all feel um, about the evidence of principal development and the impact it has, and if there's examples from around the world of great principal development that have kind of reached scale. Um, <laughs> there is not that much evidence about in that margin in developing countries at least. Uh, basically, the problem is that uh, you start thinking about, for instance, a strong leadership in the in the headmaster or the principal, and and, and uh, it's difficult to to imagine a certain type of interventions that try to to get at that. Uh, I have a program in Pakistan in which we have teacher incentives in which uh, the incentive is to move the uh, low uh, performer kids up. And we try to align the incentive of the headmaster with the professors on, uh, under the assumption that a strong leadership will organize the school in certain way and they will move uh, teachers in certain way so that the, the learning uh, and the targeting of this low, 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 uh, low baseline uh, achievers uh, will move up. And, and so far we haven't found anything. So far we haven't found any, 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 any response to that program in which uh, basically we, we, we don't know if the, the headmaster doesn't have any power in the organization of the school or basically is totally relevant the, 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 the leadership of the, of the headmaster. But the, 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 there is not that much evidence and, and, and I think that uh, that talks to a bigger point, which is, hey, let's start thinking the school as an organization and not as an uh, individual component that, 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 we can, that we can change. However, you, you, you start, and I totally agree with Abhijit in the sense that, look, if the teachers are only teaching to three students and, and, and not for the rest, uh, <laughs> it's very difficult to do any, to think about any other problem. Uh, uh, I, 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 as a teacher, I always have the problem of where do I target my teaching. As a teacher, I always have my, the problem of, okay, should I target to the best students? Should I target to the me? Should I target to the, uh, uh, low, uh, to the low achievers? And it's, it's a tough problem. And so when, when, and, and when you start thinking about that problem, everything seems kind of um, irrelevant. <laughs> The, the organization of the school, everything it it doesn't it doesn't flow. It, it's and 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 that's a tension that that I struggle is okay. How can we how can we start moving both margins in, at the same time? Can I? Uh, I would Im imagine that you know in order for a teacher to effectively do that, which is to tailor uh, instruction and pedagogy to different groups in a classroom, requires a certain capability and a certain type of skill. And what we've discussed till now is teacher training programs in general in the research show that they're ineffective. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if it's the nature of the teacher training program, meaning we are constantly talking about um, student-centric experiential learning programs that are effective for children, students in the classroom. Yet when you look at the teacher development programs, 
many of them, even the best ones I've seen in India, are teacher directed. So they're teaching you to be student directed and experiential, yet they're teaching them in a ma manner which is directed and conversational. So I wonder if the nature of the teacher training programs is problematic, one. And second, I know that the ed school hero, I mean the academic dean has been doing certain work where the effective training programs are not just in the formal instruction in the beginning, but on the basis of the coaching that, that continues after that formal training. So if we're able to actually get the training model right, maybe we'd see more effective outcomes from that training. Uh, and as a result, start to solve the kind of issues you're talking about. So we can focus on bigger issues like principal development, which I think are very fundamental. The, the, oh. last, my last word, very quickly. Uh, there is another way to see the problem. The problem is the heterogeneity of students in the classroom. And one way to solve the problem of heterogeneity is early child intervention. So one way to solve the problem, I, 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 to, to deal with the teacher is super complex. Teachers are complicated. So, uh, so one way to solve the problem is try, to try to homogenize kids before they enter the school. And one way to homogenize kids to, to try to, to, to have a very a good stimulation, a, a, a very capabilities of these kids is early child development. So I, another way to tackle the problem is, hey, let's try to reduce the expression of the kids, making them, all of them, better before they enter to the, to the system. Teachers are very complex, but, yeah. but it's a long discussion and, 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 and probably teaching, uh, teaching development is part of the critical Actually, problem. I know you want to close uh, this. Let's okay. just okay. close, you can take it offline. So I just want to quickly sum up. I think uh, the, the evidence suggests that uh, the situation is quite dismal. Um, Felipe basically said that most uh, parameters that he's looked at um, there is no evidence that there's improvement, and he's a believer that incentives could play a role. Uh, Abhijit touched on the fact that maybe there's some small uh, uh, interventions that could have big bang for the buck, but he's quite skeptical about them being integrated into the school system uh, and how, uh, you know, particularly contract teachers or remedial would work in the school context. And I know Fernando is talked more broadly about uh, the goals of education and particularly looking at uh, how it fits into the social context. Um, my sense is I, I agree with Abhijit that uh, we're targeting at a very small proportion of students in the classroom. And maybe that means, of course, we need to change some fundamentals like uh, Fernando was pointing out. But maybe it also means that we need to look at uh, technology uh, in a much bigger way in the Indian context because I, you know, we're never going to get differentiated instruction with any amount of teacher training to the extent, you know, given that there are four or five grade levels uh, sitting in a classroom. And I'm personally a believer that I think technology is going to play a much, much bigger role in India than it will anywhere in the developed world for precisely that reason. But, you know, any questions you have, please ask them offline. Let's take a five-minute bio break, and then we'll reconvene for a panel led by Tarun. Uh, Ten-minute bio break, sorry. Thank you.